high on a mountain, the warm winds are blowing, and where the winds are blowing to, there ain't no way of knowing. The mountain grass is short, it's dry and close to burning, crying out for water as the season's turning. Sweet smell of the pine, so western cedar. Hello, I'm Ayana Young, and I welcome you to Unlearn and Rewild, where we explore radical ideas relating to earth renewal. Today we're speaking with Diana Beresford Kroger. Diana is a botanist, medical biochemist, and self-defined renegade scientist who brings together ethnobotany, horticulture, spirituality, and alternative medicine to reveal a path toward better stewardship of the natural world. Orphaned in Ireland in her youth, Diana was educated by elders who instructed her in the Brehan knowledge of plants and nature. Told she was the last child of ancient Ireland, and told to one day bring this knowledge to a troubled future, Diana has done exactly that. Her bio plan is an ambitious plan, encouraging people to develop a new relationship with nature, to join together to replant the global forest. Her books include The Sweetness of a Simple Life, The Global Forest, Arboretum Borealis, Arboretum America, and A Garden of Life. Diana Beresford Kroger was included as a Wings World Quest Fellow in 2010 and named one of Utney Reader's World Visionaries for 2011. We welcome you to the program, Diana. How are you doing today? I'm good. I was looking out the window of the kitchen at all the birds at my bird feeder waiting for you. So I'm good. How has this winter been treating you and your plant sanctuary there in Ontario, Canada? Oh, well, <laughs> very, very cold and we're expecting a, another bunch of snowstorms. I've got a huge place, 160 acres, and a very large garden full of all kinds of rare species in there that I kind of hold in a hermitage of all kinds of trees and ancient foods of the Aboriginal people and gooseberries and all kinds of things like that in the garden. So I watch the weather very carefully because some of them are annuals. I have to carry them over from year to year, you know. So I have a lot of things of great interest here to all kinds of people. <laughs> well, your vision and your labors of love have been such an influence and catalyst for my work as a restoration ecologist and you've inspired me to start a native plants nursery, putting me on this quest for rare plants and trees to propagate. Oh, really? You know, the funny thing is, is that you have a wish list, okay? And it's a very peculiar thing. And I can't, I mean, I'm a scientist and I can't really give you an explanation for this. I make a wish and the species comes to me. Somehow, somewhere from around the world, the species comes in the door. The next one that will come in will be of the carrier species. And I want the carrier tom and toes, or that's the hickory, the hairy hickory, the tom and toes hickory, that the Aboriginal people used to smoke their foods. You know, in the winter time here, and actually down the continent, the food that the Aboriginal people grew were things like, you know, um, all the curcurbits, the squash, and so on and so forth. But they only last for maybe about four or five months. And what they did is they strung them up and they smoked the squash using the carrier tomatosa. And all of those things are really, really interesting to me. So that is getting to be a very, very rare species of tree. That's next on my bucket list. You know, it's very important, really, because, for instance, just theoretically, if our hydro goes down for one of many, many reasons that it could happen, how would we protect our food sources over the winter for me and for you? And we have to know these things. Yes, we cannot underestimate our reliance on forests. I loved reading about the anti-famine trees, the different nuts, and the whole savanna dynamic. 
you've given us such a solid basis for an action plan, and it's now undeniable that we just can't go on any longer as we are. No, absolutely no. I mean, there are two things I really want to do. One of them is, of course, is close to my heart, is to protect the forests that are already there. And honestly, I am surprised doing this film that the amount of forest that has gone is phenomenal. The native, actually native wildwood, virgin species that have gone all over the world, except for the boreal, all over the world have gone. So protect them and replant them back. And the other thing is to have sanctuaries of the sea start protecting the sea also. Now, I mean, I'm not doing that, but I do speak about it a tiny little bit of it, but the forests are connected to the great seas, and we can't have biodiversity, enormous amounts of biodiversity on our land by way of trees and species and not have it in the sea. If the biodiversity goes on the land, it goes also in the sea. So, we must do this. And you know, Ayanna, I've traveled the world now for this film, and your heart is the heart of many, many people across the world. So I see that as enormously hopeful. Really it is. You know, all of the news that we hear on the media, it's all bad news, it's all police reports and murders and stuff. But there are lots and lots of people across the world doing fundamentally fantastic things but you never hear their story. And you need to hear about them. You need to know there are people doing unselfish things, things for the future. And that is happening everywhere. Mm, Absolutely. And that's a big reason why we're doing the radio show, to learn and to share these stories of regeneration. And in this time with you, we're all poised to be sponges, (laughs) all the students of life listening around the world, and I just want to say what an honor it is to have you. You are truly a compass for all of us. Well, that's lovely. That's lovely to hear that. Uh, And I really should start off by saying that when I interviewed Akira Mayuwaki in Japan, he is the man who has planted, I think, something in the region of 40 million trees. Um, He is an extraordinary gentleman, and he has been trying to do work down in Brazil, in the rainforest down there, and really all over the world. And when he met me, he's a little roly-poly Japanese man with twinkling eyes. And we met before filming, before I was going to interview him and discuss biodiversity and regeneration of forests and so on and so forth. And this is very unusual for a Japanese uh, uh, man. Um, He's a scientist. He's, you know, the same as I am. And he held my hand. And he said to me, he said, I'm glad to meet you. I'm no longer alone. What a moment. Yeah. And it was, I felt the same. I felt, oh, The handshakes have already started. We are starting to hold hands across the world. And his hand was a big hand for me to hold. And I hold that in the landscape of my mind now. And I think about him. And he's doing what I'm doing. I'm doing more probably things than he's doing. I have more freedom to do things. But there are more out there. And we will meet them in the passage of this program. I'd love if you would also tell us about yourself, where you originate from, and how you were sort of impelled by circumstance to become the earth defender and teacher that you are. Well, to start off with, I'm an Irish woman, and I look upon myself as an Irish woman. I'm kind of an aristocratic mongrel, if you want to look at me that way. On my mother's family, I am. um, My pedigree goes back about 3,500 years in the Banshankas of the ancient Gaelic world in noble lines. And you'll see my family home as the Castle of Ross on Killarney Lake. 
and we were, the, in the ancient times, we were the teachers of the High King of Ireland. That's what we had been. And that, that well, it, you know, you call it a castle, but honestly, it's not a very big one. But that was built in the 5th century. And um, so I come from that lineage. And then on my father's side, they're earls and so on and so forth in England. They're lords. And my grandfather was Lord William Beresford. So I come from a mongrel side. And um, but really, my leaning is into the Celtic world, into the Gaelic world, because when my family was killed, I was the last child of that huge line of Unbanchankas of the old pedigree of ancient Ireland. And all of my mother's um, relatives, now they would be third and fourth cousins, and maybe, oh, there was one second cousin too, a whole pile of them. They were all in their 80s and 90s, and they only spoke Gaelic. They never spoke English. And they had Latin and Greek in their houses. All of the old people had Latin, Greek, and Gaelic, and they didn't really bother with English. So I was brought in under a wardship. Now, this was brought in under a Brehan wardship. And in old Ireland, they had the laws of the Brehan laws. And what they were, they were pre-Magna Carta. They had been gathered from about 1,500 years before Christ. And they were put into a written form about 400 years after the birth of Christ. And those laws became the Brehan laws. And they were in the old and ancient times known as um, the Shankus Moor, meaning the ancient laws of Ireland. And in those laws, in the Brehan laws, a child who has been made an orphan is everybody's child. Everybody had an ownership on me. And so the family thought, seeing that I was such an important child, I was brought into a wardship for three years. And I was taught all the old, ancient way of looking at nature. I was given an apprenticeship in nature in the way that I was taught all of the old um, cures, uh, the fisheigri, which in Gaelic would be the charms, the way and the modality of setting spells, um, the, the alignment of the mind for running threads on people, which is a form of telepathy. For me as a woman, they knew that I would be growing up as an only child and that I would not have enough love. Love would not would be a problem for me. I would have a scarcity of love in my life. And so they taught me how to love myself in the, in the way of blessing myself, of being grateful for who I was and what I was and how I was thinking. These are all the old ways of thought. Um, I was was taught how to use on Gutha, the voice for animals, the way of speaking to nature and the way of hearing nature, of holding silence in my mind. And that's very, very similar to the Buddhist thinking. In fact, it goes back into the ancient traditions of Buddha, and I was taught those things. And um, I was taught them all in Gaelic, and I was brought from house to house, and the different teachings were given to me. And then I was told that I would be the last voice of the ancient world of Ireland. And that was, I was 11 and 12 when I was told this, and that I had to bring that voice into the new world. And I understood the new world then to be the new world of North America. But now I think it's the new world of the modern world, not just North America. I think we have sold nature away. We have put a price on nature. We have put a price on a tree. We've put a price on all the things that are sacred to us, like the air and the water and the fish in the sea and all of the the, the sacred things to do with love, the love of a child, the love of people. All of those things have got a, a dollar value on them and a money value, and they shouldn't have because... They're part of the commonage, the great commonage of the human mind. We all have ownership on the sky. We all have ownership in the atmosphere. We all have ownership on the land. And we can hold these things in the landscape of our mind, in memory, almost forever until we die. So there are things that are very precious to us. And I think we've ignored them. And so 
as a child, I was taught how to look after the body, the spirit, and the mind. And the spirit is the soul. In the old world of Ireland, as in all the old cultures, the body is not a unity on itself. The body is connected to the mind and to the spirit. And you have bodily remedies for if you've got a cold or flu or broken limb or something like that. But there are great disasters of the mind too. And the soldiers who've gone abroad and killed people, they come back with a broken mind. That kind of thing happens to children and it happens to broken marriages where you have things, it's called PTSD now, but it is not. It's it's a mind that's broken, that's got to get put back together by the, the, the compassion of all of the society around them. And even animals and horses and dogs and They know that compassion and they'll give that to you. And then there's the soul. The soul is something different entirely. For us to look after our own souls, we have always got a battle with self, the child of self within us. We have that battle of trying to be better and better and better. And even the worst criminals have to be better and better because that's the dictate of our DNA. And so you look after that part of you where you try to do a little bit of good and you try to do a little bit better and you try to help somebody. Sometimes you succeed and sometimes you don't. All of those three things are known as the Celtic triad of the ancient world and that was part of the Brehm Law that I was taught. And so I carried them into my education and I was put into a wardship again by my uncle who was who really adopted me and it was I broke all the the, the systems of at the Irish courts in that I was given a choice by the judge of going to live with a bachelor uncle which had never happened before or to my wealthy family in England and I refused to go to my wealthy family because they had money loads and loads of money even at that time they owned planes and I thought I would just be a servant in the home so with my uncle um oh I wasn't a servant with him We would sit on one side of the fire, I'd sit on one side, he'd sit on the other side of the fire of an evening, and we would talk of theatre, of art, of plays, of physics, of Teilhard de Chardin, of Hilaire Belloc, of G.K. Chesterton, of all the old Celtic things, of Celtic plays, music, Kjotori, all of the old things between us, day after day after day, and we kind of grew together in a way. And the house was full of books. And I kind of swam in the books and read the books. He had 10,000 books, um, first copies of everything. And that was my childhood, really, in a way, is learning and learning. And then the school, I went to a private school. And it was a convent. And the nuns in the convent were so nice to me. They were so kind and so nice to me. I never heard a cross word from any of them. And I, I thought I was normal. I was probably about 14 and, or 15. And they decided to bring in the math professor from the university to teach me um, that a higher math, and calculus, and so on and so forth. And they pushed me ahead with my physics and my chemistry, and I thought this was normal. And none of the other kids there ever said boo to me. I thought like I'd be hauled off to some other class and, and taught some stuff and then come back to my own classroom and now I realize what they were doing to me and they still write to me and then I went into university and I graduated the first of the university and then I I kind of went from there with my master's and then I studied I decided to do kind of different types of studying I was like a sponge everything by way of chemistry and physics and theoretical physics quantum mechanics like I sucked it all in you know, when I did my PhD, that was, I sucked it all in. Everything I did, radiation physics, the effect of that on, on the human body. I mean, I did all that stuff. So then I decided when I was 27, 28, something like that, I decided that I would start looking after nature, that I would. Um, I saw all the trees coming down here in this on this continent. Nobody knew what they were. I knew they were getting rarer and rarer. I knew that everything was going. I was deeply aware of that. And then I thought, well, I'm going to write about these species. I am going to 
take, take the long road of writing and put what I had known into books. All of my books are peer-reviewed pretty well through Harvard. Um, E.O. Wilson, that's uh, Professor Wilson, probably known by by everybody in the, in the United States, and if they don't know him, they should know him. He was really my patron, and he was wonderful to me. He is the most marvelous treasure of a man, and he really encouraged me in what I was thinking and doing and and I started saving species, and I started to see that the Aboriginal people were being bashed down, and their all of their cultures were going, and their species were going. And I thought, no, I'm going to, I'm going to start saving them here. I'm going to start pulling them all in. And as soon as I had a bucket list of them, then they'd walk in the door for some reason. Well, like I would write for free for all of the botanical gardens across the world, and then I'd give, be given first choice of the seeds, and I was always looking for repatriation. Always, always, always. And um, all the species that I have here, like the cucumber tree, um, that's a very important tree, and the tulip, tulipifera, the tulip tree, is another one because it has got compounds in it that are really important for the management of heart diseases. And so I have a medicine walk. Let me make you imagine my garden. I have a medicine walk of North American species, and I'm very interested in the Oenthera species. I'm very interested in the species called Hysop. I'm very interested in all the chocolate-smelling, chocolate-colored species that are really, a lot of them are in North America. So I pack the medicine walk with all of them. And then I open that medicine walk to the public. And when you come in, um, what, when you come in, I ask you what propensity for diseases you have, because I have studied biochemistry. And then I will get you to touch this, only touch, or smell this, only smell, on um, different species that will give you um, will give you a preventative cure shield to your body. So uh, I have had lots of people. I was really surprised when I opened the medicine walk first. Um, I thought, oh, nobody would come. But that day, 4,000 people came. So it was kind of quite a bit of a rush, if you know what I mean. And then there is, I have a huge vegetable garden. And an inside and an outside vegetable garden, they're all heritage species that I grow. I have a heritage collection of potatoes. And then I have a small vineyard. And then, of course, I have my huge collection of nut trees that I continue to grade with my nut trees. Um, I have nut tasting. I know you're going to laugh at this, but I have nut tasting in the fall. And I like to have, with my husband Christian, to have the quality of butter in the nut, no rancidity in the nut. That means the content of the nuts, these are walnuts and shagbark hickories and hickories. It means that the oleic, linoleic and linolenic acids are at a high concentration in the nuts. These are for brain repair. These are for the repair of the myelin sheath, all of the t fat tissues of all of the communication systems of the body because our food is very, very low in these essential fatty acids right now because we're, lead we're eating industrial food. But the older ancient world had at its, at its fingertips all of these different kinds of nuts which are still essential for the body as is deep sea fish. It, it, one is equivalent to the other. One pound of nuts from North America, of black walnuts, or of shagbark hickories, or hickories. One pound of nuts is equivalent to one pound of the best black Angus meat that you can put, steak that you can possibly eat. So it's very, very high first class proteins. And then I have an orchard. In my orchard, I am breeding. Um, trees that will withstand climate change, will withstand the huge variation of climate. And the climate here now for this year is very strange. I'm sure it is for, for everybody who will be listening to me, and it will get worse. So you need to bear that in mind for all of the things that you're growing by way of food like apple trees or pear trees. And grow your apple trees or pear trees one class colder 
than what the area is you're living in. Let's say if you're living in zone six, then you grow the apple trees or pear trees or whatever into as a zone five or a zone four to get them to grow better for you now in zone six because of the variation. And it, it goes back up and down the growing ladder here for North America. And I have, I have in my orchard, I have nut trees too, and I have resistant um, chestnuts, the, the, the chestnuts, Castanea sativum, the chestnuts of North America. And they will go out in a project across North America for replanting the forest. So I've been looking after them. And I have, um, oh my goodness, I have something really fantastic that I've just kind of managed to get my hands on. And it's a white cherry. And I knew there had been white cherries in Europe years ago. And they were brought into a place called the Bruce Peninsula in Canada. And I looked and looked for them and I couldn't find them. And I put out my feelers across the world. And in Germany, in the Alps, a friend of mine was traveling there oh, about six or seven years ago now. And she knew I was looking for this white cherry. And I had described these things to her. And she said, she contacted me and she said, oh, Diana, there's an old, old 90-year-old couple want to cut down um, two cherry trees. And she said, oh, they might be the cherries that you're looking for. Well, they were. Um, they were the white cherries, so I sent instructions to them not to cut down the trees, to take the seeds, take the fruit when they were ripe, when they were ripe and full fleshed. And then what I did is I gave them instructions to to ferment the seeds. So you ferment the flesh off the the shell of the seed, the hard seed inside the cherry. Then you wash them and you make them aseptic so that they will not carry any diseases anywhere, anyhow, over into North America. And they were expressed to me and I grew them. And now I have these white cherries and I have them protected. One of them is now in my pump house um, because I want to be absolutely sure that it's strong enough to withstand climate change and I will probably espalier that one. Um, so I have lots of different things like gooseberries. And then in the other part of my garden, I have, um, oh, well, really, it's just gorgeous water gardens and um, and fragrant walkways and feeding trees and then wild areas. And the wild areas all around my garden are a huge kind of like a barrier for all of the wildlife, for the birds and for the bees. Uh, I have enormous, enormous numbers of bumblebees of all different kinds of pollinating bees coming in here. Um, just enormous, but then I have the biodiversity all the way around, the wild biodiversity, which I would like everybody to have. Um, and really, then I write about that stuff. I've written probably about 300 or so, maybe more, um, articles for, you know, all over the world about pesticides and chemistry and so on and so forth. And then there are the books. And then I thought with my books with the Global Forest, that, that book, um, it was a bestseller, which was a really big surprise to me. And I have a huge group of people in Taiwan who are my fans, which is, well, which is kind of strange. But um, that, that book then has become the film that I call Call of the Forest, The Forgotten Wisdom of Trees. And um, we traveled all around the world. Now, by we, I mean... Um, my director, which is um, uh, Jeff McKay, and my executive producer is, is Merit Carr Jensen, and she owns Merit Motion Pictures. And Jeff and I and our crew filmed what I thought would be the most important overview of the planetary problem. And I wrote the director's script, and I wanted it to be very simple. So I always say that it is a discussion that can happen at the kitchen table. I don't want it to be a discussion that's happening in the ivory tower of any university. I want ordinary people to hear the call of the forest. 
and to have it ringing in their hearts so that the children will listen to them and that the children will go out and look at the species and also respect the biodiversity around them and hear that call. So I I had to write and rewrite and rewrite. Even as I was doing that film, I was simplifying, simplifying to to make it an easy film to understand. I tried to put beauty in with science and science in with beauty and to make it so that it is a gorgeous film and that you look at it and because it is so gorgeous, I want you to understand that this is our world. This is the garden of your world. This is the global garden that we all share. We all share in its biodiversity and we will all hold hands to protect it across the world. And how we're going to do that is by the bio plan. Now the bio plan, if you read my works, you will see that we have inherited the mantle of nature. We have inherited a certain kind of divinity of life. And the divinity of life is spelt in the piano of our DNA. You just play the piano up and down, and then you get to understand how absolutely merciful it is and how that piano is played in a zero and one um, uh, pattern of, of thinking, which is the same as your computer systems. It's zero and one in all kinds of ways, and it's a binomial pattern, a fractal binomial pattern that is in your body. It's just like the falling of leaves off a tree. It's the same thing. It's the growth of a tree. It's the same thing. It's binomial growing. It goes in an exponential way, but it is binomial. So we understand these things. So even if you're cooking in a pot, it is a fractal pattern that, that, that makes your cooking, that makes you drive to your office, that makes you come home on the roadways because that's, that's how the pattern of traffic works. So from that, you can understand that God is in everything, really. You know, I mean, it's the pattern of a divine something. I can't tell you what it is, but it is there for all of us. And... Really, in a way, it's just only, I'm only saying, have respect, have compassion for those around you, and respect nature, and respect the users of nature, and try to step back, and try to have some thought, and have some compassion for the lives around you, the life of a mouse, the life of a cat, the life of a dog, the life of the larger creatures, the coyotes, all of the creatures so that we will all be one together because we're all stuck in this tapestry of life. Anyway, the bio plan is something else. In the bio plan, I'm asking you to do something. I have reckoned mathematically that if one person, one person, every person on this planet, that's about 8 billion people, plant a tree, one tree, every year for the next six years, we'll have the job done but you have to do it a little differently. What you have to do is look after the tree. There's not enough to plant it. You have to look after it, keep it. Maybe for your children, even name the tree, because that'll make sure they remember the tree. Water it, look after it, make sure it's growing. But it has to be native tree to native species into a native area. For instance, on the West Coast, you have to put in redwoods. I'm just giving you an example of one of the many hundreds of trees on the West Coast because the redwood grows to be the tallest tree on the west coast, coast of America. It's an iconic tree. And when you look at that tree, you have to lie down on the ground if you're a child and look up to the top of the tree because the trees are so tall. They're enormous. But I want you to think back about something. Because they are so tall, because they are so big, they are the greater greatest eaters of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere that we have for all species on Earth. They have this hunger for carbon dioxide, for growing and getting big and getting huge and getting dense and staying growing, stay growing and grow maybe for 4,000 years. So that's the kind of tree you need to have 
on the west coast and then it looks after the water and then it looks after the rain then it looks after the aquifers and the great oceans and the solutions of fresh water going into the great seas of the Pacific and then you have the protection of whales then you have the protection of the mammals and the fish in the sea and then you can have some protection for the sanctuaries of the sea but it is starts with a tree it starts with a tree you're going to plant now and that planting will add to the great forests of the world we can work around trees we can live around trees we can behave around trees we can do this together we will have something worthwhile because we will have put elbow grease our own elbow grease into nature and if you do that it has a meaning for you and your children forever <laughs> Is an oak tree sleeping but for a little while winter lies in the arms of spring as a mother carries her child and never knows how well the wind blows a thought carries a universe a seed carries a field of grain Love lies in the arms of change As a joy carries a pain And no one knows A wild a wind I come away from your work with a jolt of optimism because, as you show, trees are intelligent beings and they're not as passive and inert as we may think. One example that you wrote about was how trees can predict future growing conditions and act accordingly. So can you unpack this for us? And how did you come upon that marvel of nature? Well, I'll tell you, Ariana. I had been collecting butternut seeds, and those are called Juglans cinerea. That's the Latin for those. And they are really kind of going extinct. They were the medicine, one of the medicine trees of the First Nations. A very, very important nut-bearing tree with all kinds of potential in that tree. And I collected the the, the seeds of that tree from virgin forest one year. I was very, very lucky to get maybe a hundred seeds. And they didn't seem to be growing. And I thought, oh my goodness, what, what can I do to make them grow? And what I did is I put them into, I know this is kind of a silly thing to have done, I put them into a tin box in my pump house because I didn't want any squirrels or any any rodents to get at these seeds. And they were there for, you know, I keep an eye on them. They were there for over two years in cold storage in the pump house. And one spring, I went into the pump house and the strength of germination of the seeds themselves burst the tin box apart and they all germinated together and then I started looking at weather patterns that was the thing that got me interested in this all those trees grew I, I germinated them on I put them on I put them out into nursery rows and they all continued to grow they went out with my millennium project but then I started to see that I t took good note of, let's say, for instance, down in California. You would, have, you would have a poor year under the following circumstances. If you have a wind 
And if you have temperatures in the regions of, let's say, plus 2, plus 3, plus 4 in the spring, any time, January, February, March, any time in the spring, when the captains, the male captains for a species were out, when they were dangling out and they were very susceptible, the drying of the air makes the male captains susceptible to frost damage under those set of circumstances and will kill the male pollen. Pollination may happen, but it will be crippled. And under those circumstances, for that year, you will have a very poor seed set. If you have a very poor seed set in all of your species that are vulnerable to this, then you will have a poor number of mammals, small mammals, all the different mice and rodents, going right all the way up to the larger creatures. Then the birds get affected too, because all of the birds are dependent on seed pieces also, and that goes all the way up the line. So if you have something like that in one year, and then you wonder what is happening, that's what's happened. It's a very simple phenomenon, a very tiny thing of one or two degrees on the captains. So you'll have a poor year. And in the ancient times in North America, those were the years of famine. And sometimes they would last for three years. Then after the fourth or fifth year, then you would have an enormous run of seeds on the continent. And what would happen is that you have a very high sun exposure on the canopy of the tree. So spring would come and the canopy, the sun's canopy is enormous. And that means that the leaves respond to the full effect of the sun because they farm the sun. The leaves actually farm the sun in the photosynthetic reaction. Because the reaction within the leaves in the mesophyll tissue of the leaves, the mesophyll, the chloroplasts in the mesophyll can drink the carbon dioxide out of the air in the presence of moisture vapor, in the presence of sunlight to produce carbon. Carbon sugars, loads and loads of carbon sugars and evolve out oxygen, the oxygen that we breathe. The trees take this carbon sugar and pack it into their seeds. The more carbon, the better the seeds. The more sun, the better the quality of acorns, the bigger the acorns. And so you'll have a huge cycle of little mammals and creatures all the way up the line. So it is connected to the leaf. It is connected to the temperatures. And that's what I started to notice. I'd like to talk about another interaction of trees and climate. What has science figured out so far about how trees control local climates within forests, as well as the broader climate through the power of cloud seeding and other mechanisms? Uh, okay. Well, as the, first of all, there is a phenomenon within every tree all over the world, everywhere. And that phenomenon is the same as you lose it using your lungs. You've got two lungs. You breathe in, you breathe out. For a tree, it's the same phenomenon. It's called transpiration. It's a reverse phenomenon to your breathing. The tree breathes in carbon dioxide and breathes out, uh, breathes out oxygen and uses water vapor for doing that. The tree has to have water vapor to live. That's called transpiration. Transpiration is found really in a way, in a passageway, in a, in a kind of a, a way throughout the whole tree because the tree is, is controlled or does control a system of plumbing called xylem and phloem, microtubules all throughout the tree, from the top of the tree to actually the bottom of the tree underground. And some trees go way underground, down to 30, 35 feet underground. And it is, in other words, it's a column of water at the tree in the xylem passages and in the phloem passages that the tree can hold in place. And that column of water is connected to the aquifer, to the moisture in the soil itself. Now, I'm describing something to you that nobody anywhere in any university 
anywhere in the world understands how that works. The moisture vapor, the moisture comes from the soil itself into the tree, into really all the, uh, the mycorrhiza around the tree and the movement of mycorrhiza and the bacteriophages and the algae and the, the cyanophyte algae and all of the creatures and micro creatures in the soil, we actually don't really understand. We know there is a there is a movement from one set of species to another and then into the apical meristem or into the apical meristem of the root. We know that the meristematic area, we understand some of that. We don't understand how it works. We don't know. But we do know that from the surface of a leaf, the surface of a leaf releases micro molecules into the air. And those micromolecules are in the form of alpha, beta, and gamma pinenes, of, of camphors, of boronyl acetate, of all of these circular molecules that actually can go and have lift up into the air. The extraordinary thing about all of those molecules is they have methane, methyl groups, CH3, methyl groups attached to them, like the tails of a dog. So kind of if you're imagining this, try and think of a six-carbon molecule, just like a kite, with a whole bunch of dog tails hanging on the kite. It flies up into the air. It's released. There are fixing compounds. There's a whole cacophony of chemistry that's released by the tree in the spring, in the summer, and in the fall, right into the atmosphere. And those CH3 groups, those methyl groups, go flying up into the air and they hit all of the moisture in the air. And they're turned into CH3OH. They're, they're turned into another kind of molecule that's very, very water-soluble. And it sees the moisture and it goes into the moisture and it picks up more moisture. And that again picks up like a snowball rolling down a, a snowy hill and it picks up more and more and more. There's our rainfall. That's what the trees do. So they govern the atmosphere in the, man, in the manipulation of moisture. We are only just beginning to understand that. There are cloud chamber studies that have happened between MIT and happened with universities in Germany and happened with universities in Finland. They're really, really expensive experiments to do. But we're finding this phenomenon is happening all over the world. And so the trees and the forests can govern the atmosphere in that way. But there's one unique thing about the trees is that when you have evergreens, when you have green, deep green leaves, they are capable of absorbing radiation, infrared, infrared radiation, and cooling the system underneath the tree. You will have in an evergreen about a two degree temperature change from the tree to the ground. And that, that exacerbates the effect of moisture going into the tree itself. The whole phenomenon of the cycle of what a forest does to the system of moisture, we really don't understand. And there isn't anybody there except I'm giving you the wisps of what we do understand. And it's very, very important. The older the tree, the greater the effect. So when I talk about the bioplan, you folks will have to get a shovel. You'll have to plant. I would like you to plant more oak trees in California as well because they shade the soil. So you will have one tree going per person and you will look at it. But it will phenomenally change your atmosphere. It will give you increased moisture. It will fill up your aquifers. There are five major aquifers across the planet, and they're all going down, not just in California, all over the world. So we have to pay attention to the fresh water because you and I need water. All the mammals of the world need water. So we have to be sparse with what we're doing and careful with what we're doing. You see, up to 100 years ago, we did not know that this was so important. 
And up to maybe even 10 years ago, we didn't know that was important. We didn't even know the, the presence of bacteriophages. We didn't even know that they existed, except for somebody took seawater, put it on, on the cap of an electron microscope, uh, scanned it, looked at it, and said, oh, my God, there's all kinds of strange structures in this water. We didn't know about them. We know about them now. But what has happened is that, is what my, my good friend D.O. Wilson says, is we started to look at angels on the top of the pin, and we didn't look at the big picture. I'm trying to look at the big picture, and I'm trying to condense that big picture back down for everybody so that the story is like the parables of the Bible. The parables, a lot of them weren't very real, but they're a way of telling you what reality is all about. And that's really what I'm trying to do. And there's a high flying bird way up in the sky. And I wonder, does he look down as he flies on by? Oh, he's riding on the air so easy in the sky. But Lord, look at me here. Oh, I'm rooted like a tree here. I got the sit down, can't cry. Oh, Lord, I'm gonna die. Now the sun comes along, oh Lord, it lights up the day. And when he gets tired, he slides on over the way. Oh, it's east to the west, he gets gone every day. But Lord, look at What an incredible story you have just woven about the hydrology of forests. And you mentioned pinings, and I'd like if you could talk about the medicinal aerosols trees release that we may not even realize are healing us. I believe here in the redwoods, it's taxidione. Can you explain this exchange that is silently taking place in the forest of the world? Now, if you go into the, the redwood forests in, in California, I mean, we are talking iconic areas here. Like, I'd ask you to go in quite early if you want to get the taxodione onto your body. Or, like, we're, I'm talking about forest bathing here for all of the population of, of California. And honest to God, I'm asking you, I would like you to go in to shield your bodies against cancer. You're going to do this forest bathing for me right now. So you go in early in the morning before the dew has settled. So that would be, oh, I'm sorry, you've got to get up early. You've got to be there maybe by about 9, 8, 30, 9 o'clock. And bring some sandwiches with you so you're going to have a lunch. So you go in there and don't have anything on your head. Like, take your hats off and try and have um, something very loose on your body, like loose cotton of some kind, and maybe a pair of shorts with your shoes. So expose your legs, expose as much skin as you possibly can to the air. Now, as the air rises by the heat of the sun, the moisture in the air will pass by the trees in this is for July August and September, the holidaying seasons. You go in there, and as that moisture is creeping up through the trees, there is a release by means of moisture and sun of taxodione into the air. And you will be aware of it because the smell and the scent in the air changes. And that is a slightly, uh, slightly, uh, how do I call it, a, a sharp smell, and you feel it in your teeth. And what happens is it affects your salivary glands also. You want to produce more saliva and you will drink the taxodione by means of the air, by just breathing and drinking the air. 
and the taxodione will go into your system in that way. It will also land on the open skin of your body and it has fixing compounds to go with it. And what you will do is you'll walk slowly, breathing deeply so that the lower parts of your lungs, so you have a diaphragmatic breathing, keep your shoulders up straight and you walk just very slowly lollygagging down the pathways and breathe deeply with good, strong breaths. So you're getting the dione right into your system. That will give you a protective shield to cancers throughout your body. You will be getting compounds that are given to you um, if you have cancer. They're anti-cancer compounds. They're chemotherapeutical agents that are in the air and they're there in just at the right amounts of parts per trillion in the air that your body needs as a shield. They are called phytochemicals. They will go into your body and your body will use them as they, your body sees necessary and the rest of it you will pee out. And when you've come home, take a couple of, gla of glasses of really good water to flush your system and to flush your kidneys and to give you an energizing effect of the taxodione in your system. And that I have described as far as baby. You've been listening to part one of a conversation with Diana Beresford Kroger on Unlearn and Rewild. If you're not too far from California on March 19th, there is a very special all day event honoring Diana's environmental vision entitled Call of the Forest Climate, Water, and Spirit. There will be a series of panel discussions where Diana will be joined by noted authors and activists, and her film will be screened as well. Go to Point Reyes Bookstore's website at ptreyesbooks.com to get tickets. We hope to see you there. The music you heard today was Moni Musk Lads by Silly Wizard, How Wild the Wind Blows by Molly Drake, and High Flying Bird by Judy Hensky. Our theme song is Like a River by Kate Wolf. I'm Ayana Young, and our show's producer is March Young. Please support this fully volunteer project by making a contribution at unlearnandrewild.org. Thanks for listening. Dripping on the wind.